Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. All right, well, let's continue our discussion of MOS electrostatics. So as you'll recall, transistors are all about controlling potential energy barriers with gate and drain voltages. And um, the design, the electrostatic design of a transistor in order to appropriately design the properties of these barriers is something that is just critically important. We've been talking about electrostatics in the direction normal to the channel. But these devices are two-dimensional or even three-dimensional. So in this lecture, we're going to try to get an appreciation of two-dimensional MOS electrostatics. Again, we're going to cover a lot of ground. My goal is not to make you an expert in two-dimensional MOS electrostatics, but to acquaint you with some important concepts and sort of give you a pointer for uh, where you can head if you need more detailed information. So this is our TEM of a bulk MOSFET, and we've been discussing for bulk MOSFETs and for SOI MOSFETs the electrostatics in the direction normal to the channel. But these are two-dimensional devices, or even three-dimensional if we think about the dimension coming out of the page. So our goal in this lecture is to talk about electrostatics in the other direction. Now in general, this is a complicated 2D problem where the potential is varying in the whole two-dimensional cross-section here, and we can only determine that potential by numerically solving a Poisson equation. What we're going to try to do is to bypass that and get some simple physical insight into how we think about two-dimensional electrostatics. So we're going to content, we'll be content with just understanding energy band diagrams at the top surface of this structure, y equals zero, from the source, across the channel, and out the drain. Now the effect of two-dimensional electrostatics, if we, when we understand this, it'll help us understand the IV characteristics that we discussed way back in the first lecture. So here are the transfer characteristics of a typical MOSFET. And you'll remember that we have a sub-threshold current and an above-threshold current. And if we apply a larger voltage to the drain, that IV characteristic shifts in the lateral direction. If I define some current as being my critical current, when I reach that current, I'm on. That'll define a threshold voltage. And the important point is that there is a shift in threshold voltage with drain voltage. And we call that shift drain-induced barrier lowering. Now, let's look at a channel that is even shorter than channel length L1. If we have a shorter channel length, we might expect to see something like this we'll see a larger shift or a larger dibble. We might even see the slope of that sub-threshold characteristic degrade and get, uh, and the slope become less steep. Those are a consequence of two-dimensional electrostatics, and when we understand two-dimensional electrostatics, we'll be able to understand what's going on. If I were to consider a channel length that's even shorter, I might see something like this. This is a device that has a terrible sub-threshold uh, terrible sub-threshold swing and enormously high on current. In fact, under a device like this is difficult even to turn off. This would be a device that we would say is punched through. Okay. So what we see here is that the threshold voltage decreases with drain voltage. That's what we've called drain-induced barrier lowering and that describes the physics. The sub-threshold slope can degrade and if we have severe two-dimensional electrostatic effects, the device can be punched through. Now to understand this, we need to solve the 2D Poisson equation, either in the form divergence D is equal to rho, and D is epsilon times the electric field, and the electric field is minus gradient of the electrostatic potential. So we could rewrite our two-dimensional Poisson equation this way, del squared psi is equal to minus charge in coulombs per cubic centimeter divided by dielectric constant. Okay, so let's look at that equation a little bit. When we did the 1D case, we just considered variations normal to the channel. So we only had a del squared psi dy squared. And we computed that. If we compute it below threshold, we can get analytical expressions using the depletion approximation. In a real MOSFET, we'll have both terms, a del squared x and a del squared y. 
and below threshold the only charge is the depleted charge in the channel. Now the assumption that we make in a long channel device is that the curvature of the potential in the direction normal to the channel is much bigger than the curvature along the channel and therefore the 1D solution still continues to hold. Now it's precisely that assumption that begins to break down when the channel lengths get shorter and shorter and shorter and that's what we're talking about in this lecture. Now, we can always just solve this problem numerically, but our goal here is to try to get insight. So we'll look at this in a few different ways. And here's one way to look at this problem. If I move the del squared psi dx squared from the left-hand side over to the right-hand side, I'll get an equation that looks like that. If I draw my energy band diagram, and that's actually a numerically computed one, you'll see that the curvature of the conduction band is negative and the conduction band goes down when the electrostatic potential goes up, it means that the curvature of the potential is positive. So what that means is that I can think of the right-hand side here as now being an effective doping density that's lighter than the actual doping density due to this second term. What would the consequences of that be on the MOSFET? Well, you'll recall that in an earlier lecture, 2.2, we developed an expression for the gate threshold voltage, the voltage needed to create an inversion layer and bend the bands by 2 psi b. Psi b depends on the doping density. The volt drop across the oxide depends on the doping density. So if the doping density is effectively lighter due to this two-dimensional electrostatics, the threshold voltage will be smaller. And what this gives us is an understanding about why, if you measure the threshold voltage in a short channel MOSFET, it will generally be smaller than the threshold voltage in a long channel MOSFET. So it explains that roll-off or reduction in VT as the channel length decreases. Okay, now there's another way that we can look at this two-dimensional Poisson equation. So I could think about it in a barrier lowering form. So here's my energy barrier as a function of position my bottom of the conduction band from the source across the channel out the drain. If I've applied a positive gate voltage, I pull this conduction band down. So the height of that barrier is the built-in potential of that PN junction minus the surface potential of the semiconductor. Now if I apply a large drain voltage, I'm going to pull the voltage down near the drain. That'll cause the depletion region in the drain to expand into the channel. But if the channel is long enough or if the transistor is well enough designed, it won't affect the height of that potential energy barrier. So under conditions like that, only the gate controls the barrier height. The drain voltage doesn't have any effect. And since the current is exponentially related to the height of that barrier, so if I think in terms of a thermionic emission model, the probability that an electron can hop over that barrier is e to the minus barrier height over kT. And since the barrier height is not changing with drain voltage, the current won't change with drain voltage and it will be saturated. So what we would find under these conditions is that if we measured the IV characteristic under low drain voltage and we measured it under high drain voltage, there would be no translation along the horizontal axis. We would say that there is no drain-induced barrier lower. Okay. Now, in a real device, I'll have a little bit of barrier lowering. So what will happen is that when I apply a high voltage on the drain, the electric fields will penetrate through and will reach the source end of the channel. And they'll pull the conduction band down just a little bit in a well-designed MOSFET. That small reduction in the barrier height is called drain-induced barrier lowering. That's where the term dibble comes from. And because that reduction in barrier height leads to an increase in current, we'll get an increase in drain current. So in this case, if I look at my IV characteristic, my transfer characteristic under low drain to source voltage, and if I compare it to the same curve under high drain to source voltage, at a given gate voltage, I will get a higher current because the drain voltage has lowered the barrier and now more 
electrons can hop over that barrier. And that's equivalent to a horizontal translation at a given current. It takes less gate voltage to get the same current because the drain is helping me pull the barrier down. Okay, so that's the physics of dibble. You know, what's punch through? Punch through is just extreme dibble. So a punch through characteristic is one that has been degraded so much that it is impossible to actually turn the device off. If I look at the output characteristics, the output characteristics will show a strong dependence of the current on the drain voltage in the region in which the current is supposed to be saturated or independent of drain voltage. Okay, so we'll think about that as punch through. You know, one way to think about it is that the depletion region from the drain has gone all the way across to the source. You know, you know, it, another, you know, when that happens, we actually pull the conduction band down all across from the source to the channel. We remove the barrier completely and electrons just flow from the source to the drain. They don't need any help from the gate to push the barrier down because the drain has pulled the barrier completely down and removed it. Okay. Now, if we have a well-designed MOSFET, or a MOSFET that my colleague Dimitri Antonidis refers to as a well-tempered MOSFET, then these effects will be relatively small. You know, you know, if I look at what's happening under high drain to source bias, I'll find that this barrier height is controlled mostly by the gate and relatively little by the drain. If we've designed the transistor properly to achieve that, then we have a good transistor. And that's what a lot of what transistor design is about, designing the two-dimensional electrostatics such that the height of that barrier is controlled almost entirely by the gate voltage and very little by the drain voltage. So how do we control 2D electrostatics? One is we can just make the channel very long. Of course, that kind of defeats the purpose of making transistors smaller and smaller and getting more and more of them on a chip. You know, the other is to design a short channel device in a way that that electric field from the drain doesn't penetrate through across and pull the barrier down at the source. And that's really what a lot of what transistor design is about these days. So let me shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about this transistor design. And I want to remind you of some a basic concept in semiconductor physics. If I have a uniform semiconductor, say n-type semiconductor with a lot of free electrons, and if I put a positive charge in, perturb the potential somewhere, those mobile electrons will move around and try to screen out or cancel that positive charge. And that's a problem that we can solve. And what you'll find is that as you move away from that perturbation, the potential will just exponentially decay away. And the decay constant is this characteristic length. And that characteristic length is related to the electron density or doping density. And it's known as the Debye length. So the Debye length is this characteristic length that it takes to screen out a charge perturbation in a bulk semiconductor. Okay, so that's an important concept. That's why we have a red box around it. Let me just remind you how that's derived here very quickly. If we start with the Poisson equation and we ask, what if there's a perturbation of the electron density away from its value for a neutral semiconductor? Well, I can expand the electron density in terms of its value for the uniform neutral semiconductor, and I can relate it in a Taylor series expansion to the perturbation of the electrostatic potential. So if the potential is perturbed down a little bit, the electron density will go up. And then I can use this perturbation in my expression for the charge density, and I can put it back in my Poisson equation. And what we'll find is that del squared perturbation in potential is 1 over this characteristic length squared times the perturbation itself. So we get a differential equation that we can solve. That differential equation will, will give us these screened exponential solutions. If I want to actually evaluate that characteristic length, I'll assume that Boltzmann statistics apply. I'll do that derivative, and I'll get this classic expression for the Debye length. Okay. Now, what I want to talk about is something that is similar but different. So we're looking at MOSFETs under sub-threshold conditions. 
there aren't a lot of free carriers to do any screening in the channel. But there's a different type of screening that goes on because there are metal plates around the channel, the gate electrodes, or the conductive substrate. This is called geometric screening. And let me just try to explain to you how this works. So here's our two-dimensional Poisson equation. And what I'm going to try to do, and this is just a plausibility argument, it's not the full mathematics. I'm going to try to convert this 2D equation to a 1D equation, which is easier for me to deal with. And the way we'll do that is to first of all recall the 2D solution. The bands were bent down because there was a positive gate voltage. So the electrostatic potential increases towards the surface and then increases linearly across the gate oxide. Okay. So when we did that 1D solution, we were solving this simple Poisson equation. And if I'm trying to remove this derivative from the 2D equation, let me try to do that by relating this curvature of the potential. I know that it's induced by the gate voltage. And the gate voltage has to be more positive than the surface potential to bend the bands and induce this curvature. So let me just write it this way with some parameter gamma squared, which remains to be determined. If I can determine it appropriately, I'll get the same answer that I get by solving the Poisson equation in 1D. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll just equate the right-hand sides of those two equations, and that will allow us to solve for that. And uh, we know what that answer is. It's given by 1D MOS electrostatics. So by putting those two equations together, we can put two into one and solve for gamma. <coughs> And we'll find that this characteristic length depends on dielectric constants, widths of the depletion region, and widths of the, of the gate oxide insulator. So the 1D Poisson equation can be written in this form. Okay. How does that help us solve this problem? Well, let's go back to the 2D problem that we're trying to solve. This 2D problem is very difficult. We need to solve it numerically. Uh, in 1D, we can write the, the curvature normal to the channel in this form if we properly choose this parameter gamma. So if I use this expression for del squared y, I can convert my Poisson equation into a 1D Poisson equation along the channel in the x direction. And I'll get an expression that will look like this. Okay, then let me just make a change of variables, instead of dealing directly with the surface potential, let me just make a change of variables and re subtract some constants and deal with a different potential psi, because then the equation just looks a little more familiar. So this is my 1D uh, Poisson equation along the channel, and you can see that that equation has exactly the same equation that we had in the bulk when we were talking about Debye screening. So this parameter gamma must play the same role that the Debye length played for free carrier screening. And we're going to call that a geometric screening length. So we've deduced that the geometric screening length is, re is given by depletion layer thicknesses, oxide thicknesses, dielectric constants. Um, if I do this calculation for an SOI device, you'll get a different geometric screening length that will be a, generally be a little bit shorter than the bulk MOSFET. If I do it for a double gate MOSFET, I'll get a different geometric screening length that is even shorter yet. And if I do it for a cylindri cylindrical or nanowire MOSFET where the gate is wrapped entirely around, I'll get an even shorter geometric screening length. The point is, whatever the structure, I can, I can create a 1D Poisson equation along the channel from the source to the drain that is in terms of this parameter we call a geometric screening length. Now, now, the objective of MOSFET design is going to be to try to make that screening length as short as possible because in order to have a well-defined electrostatically well-tempered MOSFET, we need to make the channel length longer than that geometric screening length. All right. And people now are beginning to move from bulk to SOI and double gate-like structures and even nanowire structures in an effort to achieve smaller and smaller geometric screening lengths and therefore shorter and shorter channel lengths. 
Okay, now, what is this geometric screening length? All I showed you now was some algebra that was really a plausibility argument. What is it physically? Well, it's relatively easy to see. If I were to do a calculation of a MOSFET and plot the electric field lines, that's what you're seeing here in the blue, the electric field lines that are emanating from the positive voltage on the drain, what you would see is that they would terminate on negative charges. Some of them will terminate on the gate electrode, some of them will terminate down on the heavily doped substrate, which is like a metallic electrode. The spatial extent of those electric field lines is this geometric screening length. It is these metal plates, or metal-like semiconductor on the bottom, that are screening out the electric field lines and preventing them from penetrating too far and affecting this barrier at the source. So gamma <laughs> is just the length of duration of those uh, electric field lines. This is a numerical calculation of a double gate MOSFET. And again, the blue lines are the electric field lines. And you can see that the electric field lines coming out of the drain are not penetrating over to the source end and affecting the barrier. They're terminating on the metal electrode on the top and the bottom. So again, that distance over which they penetrate is the geometric screening length. And we would like to make that as short as possible because then we can bring the source closer and closer to the drain. And that's precisely the reason that people are moving these days towards different structures. The geometric screening length in a bulk MOSFET has been pushed to about as short a value as we can. But if we shift to things like FinFETs, which is like a double gate MOSFET standing vertically, then we have an even shorter screening length. And if we go to gate all around structures or nanowire structures where the gate goes completely around the channel, we get a shorter geometric screening length yet. So these new structures are all about controlling MOS electrostatics in very short devices. All right, now I'm going to give you one more way of looking at this problem. So these are all alternatives to actually solving numerically the two-dimensional Poisson equation. But each way we look at it gives us a different piece of insight and a different way to appreciate 2D electrostatics. So the final way that we're going to talk about is a capacitor model for 2D electrostatics. So remember that what's important is its virtual source, and we have a gate that is supposed to pull the energy barrier up and down and change the surface potential at that point. And there's a gate capacitance that, that connects the gate electrode to that top of the barrier in the semiconductor. Okay, but the drain can also affect the potential at the top of the barrier, and I can represent that as a capacitor from the drain to the top of the barrier or the virtual source. That's a capacitor that it's more difficult to compute. I'll need to do that with a numerical calculation. But the device is symmetrical, so there's a source, so there's also a capacitor between the source and the virtual source, and there's a capacitor to the bulk. That might just be the depletion capacitance of the semiconductor capacitor. So there are really four different contacts that can control the potential at the top of the barrier. There's a gate contact, a source contact, a drain contact, and the body or bulk of the wafer contact. And this is a problem in circuit analysis that's relatively easy to handle. Now, if I define the total capacitance to be the sum of all those capacitors, then I can develop an expression for the surface potential, assuming that I've grounded the source. It's just the ratio of the gate capacitance to the total capacitance times the gate voltage plus the ratio of the drain capacitance to the total capacitance times the drain voltage. So obviously I want the first ratio to be close to one and the second ratio to be close to zero. Then I'm mostly controlled by the gate and just weakly controlled by the drain. And we can show that the subthreshold slope is 2.3 times this parameter m times kt over q. And we can derive from some simple analysis this parameter m it's just the total capacitance divided by the gate capacitance. So that that's going to be a number that's bigger than 1. And we can show that the dibble is just the ratio of the drain capacitance to the gate capacitance. So we can get some very simple expressions for measured uh, terminal IV characteristics in terms of these capacitors. And again, the goal of transistor design is going to be to minimize the drain capacitor and to maximize the gate capacitor. 
Okay, so that's about it. We've been talking about how to design an electrostatically well-tempered MOSFET. When we've done that, we have arranged things so that at the top of the barrier, the charge is given by 1D MOS electrostatics and is just weakly determined by the drain voltage. So there's a region near the beginning of the source that's strongly under the control of the gate and weakly under the control of the drain. And if I increase the drain voltage, all I do is to increase the volt drop near the drain, but I have a very small effect on the barrier height, which gives me a very small dibble. Now, the charge at the top of the barrier or at the virtual source does depend weakly on the drain voltage because the threshold voltage depends a little bit on the drain voltage. That's what dibble does. So there is a small reduction in threshold voltage when I increase the drain voltage and that's how 2D electrostatics plays out in a device. Okay, so you can see this in a real device. Here are two bulk silicon MOSFETs. One with a 105 nanometer channel length that has nice, well-defined characteristics. One with a shorter channel length. And you can see in that shorter channel length that you have an increased dibble, a horizontal translation, but you have more than simply an increased dibble. You also have a degraded subthreshold slope. It's not nearly as steep as it was in the first case. It wasn't just a horizontal translation. So MOS electrostatics is all about designing transistors that are, have as short a gate lengths as possible, but display IV characteristics that look like this. Okay, so we've talked a lot about MOS electrostatics. What we're going to be able to do now in the final lecture for this week is to pull all of this together, go back to our virtual source transistor model, and really make it a much more comprehensive and uh, accurate model of modern day transistors. So we'll take, we'll continue the discussion, in the next lecture. Thank you.